Hello. Welcome. I'm Sam Ankerson, the Executive Director of the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum. And thank you for joining this program. Good evening from Sanibel and the museum. I'm in the library of the museum right now. We appreciate your interest in hearing about the museum as we approach the one year anniversary of the landfall of Hurricane Ian. And that anniversary is actually two weeks from today. Uh, I know that uh, uh, people are tuning in from all over the country and have different degrees of, uh, of connection to, to the island and to the museum. So I thought I'd uh, just say a couple words about how, how the island is, is doing. The, there, there have been some, I would say, generally speaking, and I, and I think uh, others on the ground here would concur with this, would, would characterize it as, as slow but steady progress. There have been some important milestones. All the public beaches are open again. The, the quality of the water is, is great. Um, symbolically and, and otherwise a, a big win, the, the Sanibel Lighthouse was relit in, in June. Uh, several dozen restaurants are open. It's been a banner sea turtle season for sea turtle fans out there. It's been uh, one of the best on record. Uh, other wildlife are more, you know, signs of returning wildlife all the time. The library is open, and um, there's there's progress. A a a gut check for a lot of us earlier this summer. Uh, Bailey's General Store, Bailey's Plaza, uh, came down, was demolished in preparation for rebuilding. But the good news there is that uh, that anchor of this community is is on the way to coming back better than ever. And the community house, another anchor of the community, is is in great shape and is going to be ready for the coming season. There are still big challenges, of course. Uh, insurance is a is a roadblock for for many. Uh, individuals and uh, especially perhaps the uh, condo associations and HOAs that comprise about forty percent of the the residences on the island, but um, but things are are moving forward. So before we get to to the museum, uh, I wanted to put in a plug for uh, next month's Zoom lecture given by my friend and colleague, Dr. Jose Leal, the science director and curator here at the museum. He'll be giving a talk called The Charisma of Cowries, and that is on October 12th. You can, uh, it's free. You can sign up for that through the museum's website, shellmuseum.org, and then go to education and lectures, and you can sign up there just uh, as you did for this one. If you have questions on tonight's program, please, this is the webinar format of Zoom. So please use the chat function by scrolling either on the, the bottom or top of your screen and, and clicking chat and, and type in your questions. And I'll be glad to uh, get to those at the end of the program. So usually our, uh, our, our lectures, whether in person or has, as, has, as has been the case for the last year on Zoom, are along the lines of, of uh, science of mollusks, uh, conservation related issues of conservation, or uh, where culture and history bump up against shells or mollusks. And uh, to, tonight is is more a story of a, an institutional journey uh, of the last year, uh, one that's included a, a lot of shock and loss uh, to begin with, but also through the response, and we'll touch on some highlights of it uh, through the response of, of people associated with this museum, whether it be staff or board or volunteers, but equally, if not more so, from the community that surrounds us, the, the residents of this area, the uh, community of museums and aquariums who have, um, who have, who have risen to the call. There have been uh, moments of accomplishment and, and hope and it's all it's all combined to create uh, a vision for a path forward 
and that we're very proud of. And it's uh, so for us these days, it's not just a rebuilding, but it's a renewal, and hence, hence the uh, the title of tonight's tonight's program. And before before getting into all that, I wanted to offer a little bit of history and context about what makes this museum a different and 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 special. It's it's a museum that uh, was built from the ground up by uh, a volunteer movement that began in the mid 1980s, who coming out of the Sanibel Captiva Shell Club and others, uh, people who believed that Sanibel um, was a place where there needed to be a shell museum. And why Sanibel? Well, many of us know that, that Sanibel has a reputation as one of the, the great shelling destinations in the US. And here we're looking at the island and a big reason for that is, is its geography. The uh, there's kind of two parts to that. There's uh, you know the Gulf of Mexico is an unusually shallow uh, body of water. At least um, you know the 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 land shelf that extends from land out out uh, out towards the Gulf stays shallow for a very long time, uh, allowing mollusks which which feed and live along the bottom typically. Uh, to kind of roll along, sort of uninhibited, and then Sanibel is 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 a big island. It's about the size of Manhattan, and it's atypical in the sense that it is boomerang shaped, as you can see, and it's also east west oriented off the mainland. Most barrier islands are are north south, and um, this these factors combine to create conditions conducive to large pileups of shells on the beaches, which um, which those of us who were around here recently, Hurricane Adalia, which uh, thankfully uh, recently went went sort of nearby but didn't didn't come right over here, uh, would have noticed that the those shell piles um, um, were back. And so it became a place for for collecting and um as as people more and more people visited in the in the first part of the 20th century it uh, the reputation developed and this is a an image of one of the first shell shows um held at the community house actually this is from the 1930s and the uh, uh the bug for for shell collecting and for visiting this area to shell um grew and so and so a group of volunteers thought about creating a museum here. And they brought in uh, this gentleman on the right, his name is Tucker Abbott, uh, a, um, um, a scientist uh, specializing in mollusk and shells who um, is prominent in several museums and before coming I mean, here at the Delaware Museum of Natural History, but also an author of dozens of books in the 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, a few of which were bestsellers, including this one, American Seashells, and was responsible in 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 many ways for popularizing uh, shelling and shell collecting as as a hobby, as an activity, and then a pursuit that led to greater study and appreciation of shells. And he uh, was the was the founding director of the museum. And here's a picture of Tucker holding um, an Australian triton, which is actually the, the largest, largest uh, gastropod in the world, but also with some others who were instrumental in creating the museum, including on the, the, the left, of, left of Tucker, the actor uh, Raymond Burr. Um, and for those who, who don't know who Raymond Burr is, Raymond Burr is Harry Mason. So in uh in the early 90s late 80s early 90s he's he was a shell collector Raymond Burr. he he joins the effort um with his with his friend Tucker to help bring attention to uh the cause of creating a a, a shell museum on Sanibel and in conjunction with the efforts of the volunteers who have been amassing or or putting together collections and raising funds for about 
10 years. And, and then the, the generous donation of the land on which the museum is built by the Bailey family, uh, same family as Bailey's General Store, uh, opened the museum in 1995. And here's a view of, of the museum um, in the late 90s. And at the time, the the most of, I'd say 95% of the experience of visiting the museum was what's called the Great Hall of Shells, which is up on the second floor of the museum. It's about a 3,000 square foot space, which uh, upon opening had about uh, 30 exhibits of shells from all over the world, the biology of shells, or mollusks rather, and also um, points of intersection between mollusk shells and human history and culture. Uh, for example, the uh, Calusa uh, Indians who who lived in Southwest Florida for, for um, uh, thousands of years and where shells play into uh, currencies such as cowries, um, our inspiration for art and architecture and, um, and onward. And over the years, these exhibits uh, were, were added to with with interactive features, uh, but the the experience uh, up until 2020 of of visiting the museum was the the Great Hall of Shells, and um, um, that was the experience of, of visiting the museum up until 2020. In 1996, uh, Dr. Jose Leal joined the museum as as curator and as executive director and he remains with the museum uh, to this day. He's had um, uh, roles of, of leadership of the museum and of curating the collection and of, and of science and research for, um, for all these years. And among his, uh, under his leadership, um, you know, the, the building of the collection, um, I would say was the, was the, the main accomplishment today. The, 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 uh, collect the shell collection of the museum numbers over 550,000. And to put that into a little bit of context, there, you know, there, there are a few, you know, say three dozen, four dozen maybe museums in the country that have significant collections of mollusks slash shells. They typically uh, tend to be uh, large natural history museums, including the biggest ones, the American uh, Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, Natural History Museum of New York, uh, Los Angeles, the field. And this uh, new and uh, much smaller museum um, under Jose's leadership uh, built a collection which in the uh, within the context of, of, of these other museums is is among the largest and um, and best of its kind are we the, the, the collection uh, represents the, the specimens from all over the world. There is an emphasis on on Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean and Florida, and and this collection is is um, is our is our is our greatest asset. He also led the museum to in 2010 achieve accreditation by the American Alliance of Museums. That's the that's the sort of standard bearing, uh, standard setting organization for museum and, and educational excellence in the U.S., um, a major, uh, a major achievement. So sometimes people ask why, um, you know, why such a large collection of shells, a very, very small fraction of the shells in the collection uh, can, can be on public view for, for space reasons. And some of the larger museums in the, uh, in the previous slide have collections in the millions. And the, uh, the, the value of these kinds of, of our collection and really any natural history collection, whether held by a, by a museum or, or a university is in the, the data that's associated with the specimens. And in the case of, in the case of shells, it's where were they collected and when. And what this information helps inform, especially when combined with the same data from other institutions that have these kinds of collections, is a, a record of of this life form on Earth. So if you have 
uh, data, you know, going back, you know, you know, a few hundred years on on what the, you know, where where they were collected and when you get you can get a sense of their um, their relative health or um, or the opposite of that uh, over time, and this information helps to inform these days current studies on on water quality, on 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 climate change, on on warming oceans, and this slide right here is is reflective of a project that we are a collaborative project that Jose is leading that we're in right now with about 15 other organizations mapping the species distribution over time of, of mollusks um, throughout the eastern seaboard. And uh, and what these different dots are are, are different geo-referencing points, but it's a uh, uh, illustrative, I think, of, of the importance of not just a shell collection, but uh, natural history collections in general. Another way in which in which the collections help inform science. This is a a slide of of researchers from the University of South Florida, who over the past several years have been doing a study of the uh, the Florida horse conch, which is uh, an iconic species, the the largest largest species of mollusk in the Gulf of Mexico. The horse conch is the Florida state shell. And through a combination of their field studies out on the water, but then also examining um, historic specimens like this one from our collection, the museum holds uh, some of the uh, largest horse conchs ever, an oldest horse, horse conch collected, um, and taping, taking samples from, from those specimens. They are able to uh, conclude for the first time that this very important species is actually uh, endangered in the area, and uh, that provides the science to be able to uh, try and and take measures to uh, provide a a level of protection um, to to the horse conch. I'll say a few words um, also just along you know along the lines of what what kind of distinguishes this museum about natural history museums in general uh they um grew out of a collecting um tradition that that started or or maybe sort of gathered steam you know particularly in the 17th 18th and 19th centuries with with um as european um um societies travelers sort of moving around the world and exploring uh different parts of the world of course there's a you know there's an imperialism uh undercurrent to all this but um but also collecting objects artifacts specimens of natural history um from their travels and then bringing them home uh leading first to to uh what were called curiosity rooms when people fill their their homes uh, rooms in their homes with with objects they collected, and then the curiosity cabinet, more um, you know, discrete kinds of exhibits that uh, reflected objects and specimens of interest um, from uh, all over the world. This is a detail of a curiosity cabinet. You can see you can see I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but. Um, Shells are. This is a nautilus right here. Here's a here's a triton up here in the in the upper right. And shells, mollusks were very much uh, a part of this. And this is kind of the beginning of organized uh, collecting of natural history, which was a precursor to ways in which natural history is exhibited today. This is from a um, from a uh, one of the oldest natural history museums actually in 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 Zurich and is also a precursor to the great natural history museums in this country which which started up in the mid 19th century early 20th century this is the museum of natural history in new york and the field museum in chicago both of which have very um very large collections of mollusks and 
Well, what's happened in natural history museums over the last several decades, <laughs> as relates to to Mollus, has been a reduction of um, a reduction of or elimination in most cases, actually, of of mollusks shells on public exhibit as priority has been given to um, other uh, subjects of natural history, be they dinosaurs or or something else, and also the um, you know the staff that uh, um, that support that. So it's been a a a shrinking of the field in a sense. And there are a uh, museums are complex organizations, particularly large museums, and there are there's a, a wide wide range of educational goals they may have. Um, their their needs to respond to to their audience or community. There are of course questions of revenue and sustainability, and they all have a different calculus. But um, for uh, for our area of focus, it's um, for for mollusks and shells. It's um, it's it's been a downward trend, with one major exception, and these are a couple of uh, images from the Houston. Museum of Nature and Science, which is a, a terrific museum. If you haven't visited, I strongly encourage you to do it. Great natural history museum. And which has a, a hall of, of malacology. For those who don't know, malacology is the study of mollusks. And it's it's actually prominently located. You have to, you know, to get to to get to the the, the African animals exhibit, you need to go through the Hall of Malacology. And they have recently invested in a, um, a redesign and a reinstallation of their Hall of, Malico of Malacology uh, to, to great success. Um, Jose and I visited last year, opened last, last year or maybe two years ago. And um, uh, Jose and I visited in June and under the the leadership of their their curator uh, Tina Petway and and collections manager uh, Gary Kidder, created a, um, a very compelling uh, exhibit of over a thousand specimens that achieves the goal of um, uh, attracting you know bring drawing in a visitor through the beauty of these specimens, which which many of us were all attracted to initially and, and, and drawn to the subject through that gateway um, to um, to learn more about the animals and their biology and um, and issues around them. So um, another and so these are aquariums or pre-storm aquariums at the at the Shell Museum. And of course another another uh, Fact, very important. You know, this is the most important addition to the museum since it since it first opened in 1995. Um, was the addition in 2020 of the living gallery of aquariums. So, 10,000 gallons of water, 11 aquariums, exhibiting live mollusks and other marine life, uh, about 60 species. And so, um, so what maybe makes this museum different is along with Houston. You know, we're one of one of two in the country with significant exhibits of shells and the uh, only one with that also um, exhibits the living animals. So that combination uh, makes the museum unique and um, and gives us a position uh, to be proud of. The addition of these aquariums culminated in uh, another great milestone for the museum. Before I mentioned the the accreditation by the American Alliance of Museums, and in 2010, in uh, this is a, a photo. This is Carly Hulse, our, our senior aquarist in the center, and and Jose Lau on the left, and me, I guess, <laughs> all right. Um, and uh, after having received accreditation by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, which, like the American Alliance, is is the is the standard bearer for best practices in operation and um, and education in in zoos and aquariums. So, so this this organization and this accreditation was received actually exactly one month before for Hurricane Ian, and. Um, um, and we're just one of 12 
organizations in the in the United States to be accredited by both. So it's something um, something we're very proud of. All right. So enter Hurricane Ian one month after um, that accreditation. This is a here comes a storm. For those who can see my cursor who don't know, here's uh, here's Sanibel right there. So this uh, historic storm with with winds of um, exceeding 150 miles an hour, a uh, a storm surge that that completely covered Sanibel and it at at in at points reached up to to 13 feet of uh, flooding. No no structures escaped um, impact and and the museum. Um, you know, had of course had quite a bit of damage. So, the, you know, the next the next images are are of the you know the kind of the the shock and loss part of this of this journey. This is the uh, um, uh, this is the museum on October second when a group of three of us were were that was the first time we were able to get to the island um, you know, a few days after this a few days after the storm. Um. There's a silly picture of me pointing to our 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 water line. There was a, a five and a half feet of flooding throughout the throughout the ground level, and on the ground level, of the museum is where the aquariums were slash are. In addition to our our welcome lobby and our uh, museum store and and backup house functions, and um. As far as the aquariums go and the and the marine life, there are really two factors. Um, you know, we we lost about eighty percent of our marine life and all the all the equipment that uh, makes the aquariums run um, was was destroyed. And uh, there were there were two two main factors as as far as the marine life go. One was that uh, before power was knocked out the and floodwaters came in the uh the pump systems for the aquariums were pumping contaminated water through all of um, um through all of the aquariums and then uh secondly about half of our animals are cold water mollusks so they they need their water at about 55 degrees and to keep that water cold one of the one of the inputs to that is of course electricity and once the generator was knocked out um octopuses are, are among the among the cold water animals the um the cold wall cold water animals um could not uh could not survive and here are a couple more images of that other parts of the ground level this is the lobby back a house and store This is uh, up on the third floor. This is one of two two breaches of the uh, of the roof that we also experienced, despite having installed a, a brand new metal roof um, just uh, a couple months before the storm. And this uh, this about twenty foot by four foot hole is is right over the uh, storage for the research collection of shells, which are held in those metal cabinets. That's just a few of them but they're throughout the third floor. And, um, and uh, that was what you see there. And that necessitated a, a, an emptying out of that space and uh, a gutting of, of walls and ceiling as, as mold would spread. Another breach in the roof was in the Great Hall of Shells. So while, not a, while there was not a, uh, as dramatic a hole ripped in the roof, uh, the soffits were blown out, uh, leading to uh, water, um, uh, wind, wind-driven water being sent in and uh, soaking the, uh, the, uh, the trusses in the ceiling and, and the upper walls and um, requiring those to be um, also gutted. And then also um, uh, subsequently uh, damage to the floors and to to several of the um of the exhibits underneath uh we've begun rebuilding 
the rebuilding began in earnest in in mid April, and um, where our timeline currently is to reopen the ground level, including the aquariums, by the end of this calendar year, and to reopen the uh, second floor, including the Great Hall of Shells, in the March April time frame, and. Um, the reason for a longer time frame on that is, is, is plans we have to redesign it, and I'll get to those in a little bit. So now I'd like to, um, you know, after after sharing some of the, you know, some images of of, of what we what we encountered um, or, or what the damage was at the museum, to talk about some of the moments of accomplishment, which together have uh, created a sense of renewal and have led to our our faith in and our vision for uh, uh, the future. They're not the only such moments, but they're, they're some of the ones that um, that stand out. And this scene probably you know probably everyone here on the on the program recognizes, you know it, it's uh, um, this is, you know, one of the more, one of the most dramatic uh, representation of the storm's impact, which is the, the, um, not the destruction, but the heavy damage to the causeway, the bridge, the the single line between the mainland and and Sanibel, which was severed in, uh, in in six places, and in the, uh, in the weeks following the storm, with everyone not knowing what um what the future held as far as the repair of the bridge which was repaired in three weeks which was amazing uh but no one knew uh nor did anyone have any sense of what um any kind of um what the environment might be for the re restoration of power or anything and everyone desperate to get to the island and um from our point of view and other other organizations, nonprofits in the island to to not having any idea of what the damage was, what there was almost immediately was a, an incredible um, rallying of nonprofit organizations, the city of Sanibel, to mobilize whatever resources were available to help this museum and other organizations get to where they needed to be to try and start to respond, to understand what the problems were, to try to start salvaging what could be salvaged and um, and taking and taking action. And there were very few entities with with what was needed, which was boats and trucks. Boats, of course, to get you across the bay. And then equally, if not more importantly, trucks to to transport you to where you needed to be. This slide is, there's a, there's a senior aquarist again, Carly Hulse. This is um, on October 2nd, the first day she and and I and, and one other staff member were able to to get to the island with, with um, folks from Ding Darling um, on one of their boats, uh, bringing, us, bringing us across. And over those, what wound up being three weeks, what, was happening um, every day was organizations like Ding and the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation and the city of Sanibel, this is the city of Sanibel's shuttle that got up and running amazingly quickly, were, um, we'd be in touch every day um, to see, uh, um, you know, priorities were for emergency workers and for and for critical needs. Um, um, search and rescue was was going on during this time for people who had remained on on the island during the storm. But um, but there was you know almost a daily um, you know sort of round of calls to see who had space. And um, each day, beginning October second, and every day until. Um, until the uh, the bridge reopened, uh, we would um, be able to find out from 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 uh, one of these one of these three uh, how many spaces they might have for Shell Museum staff to be able to get over 
and um, where we needed to be to catch the shuttle. And then um, they would get us there and get us back. And it, um, um, you know, it was perhaps the most important thing in in saving saving what we could, um, which was a lot, <laughs> um, and doing our best to to protect the museum's assets. And you know, from that we moved to a couple a couple rescue stories, a couple good stories. So this this um, this is a, a mollusk called the flamboyant cuttlefish, and they're amazing animals from the South Pacific. And there are cephalopods, which is the same kind of group of mollusks as octopuses are. Uh, don't have the 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 level of intelligence of octopuses, but they do have intelligence. They um, they're beautiful. To look at beautiful colors, and they and they uh, change color um, based on reaction to um, animals or or people who may be in their midst. They display um, emotion. And they sort of camouflage on a dime as well. And we had an exhibit pre-storm of about six, um, six cuttlefish. And um, you know, not knowing again, here's here's that scene again of what just about all the you know aquariums looked like when we came in, not knowing on that first day what we might encounter. Uh, our goal that first day was to do an animal rescue of as many as we could. And um, when we arrived, just about every you know aquarium looked like this, and uh, and most of the marine life um, had perished. Uh, but those that were alive were, were local mollusks, which you know have evolved to handle conditions like this in this part of Florida. And um, amazingly, the flamboyant cuttlefish. This is a, a picture taken that day, October second. Uh, fortuitously, their their uh, pumps. The pumps for their aquariums had stopped working, so that contaminated flood water that did um, wreak so much havoc elsewhere wasn't a factor here. And their aquarium was full; the water was clear. They were swimming around perfectly happy. One of them had laid a whole bunch of eggs. And prior to this, um, um, to us uh, being able to to get over on October second, thanks thanks to Ting Darling, we had coordinated with. Uh, our friends in the aquarium community. And there was a group from the Florida Aquarium, uh, which is in Tampa, which was waiting on the mainland with um, vans and staff and equipment for whatever animals uh, we might be able to bring back that they would then take to uh, to the Florida Aquarium for safekeeping. And uh, we were able to um, to save all the cuttlefish and their eggs and and bring them back and hand them off to the Florida Aquarium folks. And um, I think a, a pretty amazing part of this whole story is cuttlefish don't have very long lifespans, but when we reopen the aquariums uh, later this year, uh, the cuttlefish that we'll be reinstalling this exhibit with will be uh, descendants of the ones that were uh, that were rescued on, on October 2nd. Next story is about our shell collection. So we saw that, that picture before of, of the roof hole and, and, our, um, and our research collection up on the third floor. And our big concern was not knowing, not having any idea about how long um, it was gonna be before a roof hole could be repaired, um, how long, you know, how much longer water was gonna be coming in how much longer we were going to be without uh, climate control. So our our priority after animal rescue was to take the most um, at risk um, parts of the collection, the ones closest to uh, to the breach, and get them to a safer place, which in our case meant the meant the second second floor of the downstairs to the second floor of the museum. And here you see staff um, um, trying to manage the um, the, the hole in the roof um, to you know, cover the collection in, in protective sheeting. But then, you know, the big, sorry for the blurry picture here, but then the big, uh, uh, the big effort was to, each of these collection cabinets holds uh, 26 drawers of, um, of specimens, was to remove the drawers one by one and wrap them 
And we did it with as many museum staff as we were able to get on the island. Also, here's another case of um, the nonprofits pulling together staff from Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation. There's one represented here, uh, sending staff over to help bring them down uh, the drawers one by one to the second floor, bringing down the cabinets and then um, storing them until the cabinets were down there, reinstalling them into the cabinets. And this is how um, they are today, awaiting the point in reconstruction where we can start to bring them uh, back up onto the third floor. But about half uh, or a little less than half of the collection, you know, over over 200,000 um, specimens were moved out of the um, um, the worst of the conditions, uh, thanks to, um, you know, again, it would not have been possible without people getting us here and then um, gave it, giving us giving us hands to help. A next big moment for us was a temporary reopening. And this is a, uh, this, is a this is a ribbon cutting on February 1st. So we realized there was a um, there was going to be a, a period of time between when the museum was as as gutted out as it needed to be. And uh, after that ended and before reconstruction started, where um, where we were going to be idle and that period was going to be roughly February through April. And so we um, we made the decision to open, although a a museum without its aquariums and with a damaged Great Hall wanted to uh, be there as a as a resource um for for people and um and to engage with the public again and and people came it uh we we had free admission the great hall of shells was open we were able to bring volunteers back and started a new program called shell and tell a um where volunteers engaged the zan mater one of our very favorite volunteers uh where volunteers engaged with uh with visitors about different kinds of, you know, taught them about different kinds of shells from all over the world. And it was a very, you know, we didn't have oodles and oodles of visitors, but um, about 3,000 visitors over that three month period. But what was, um, it was just very uplifting to be a museum again <laughs> and um, to, to do what we do. And people who came in were, uh, interested in the museum and and in the shell exhibits as as they might typically be, but also it was very um, you know, visitors from outside the area wanted to hear about the storm and wanted to hear what it was like and wanted to talk to uh, staff and volunteers about um, about their experiences and then also residents those that were that were coming back and um, and and working on their homes or maybe wanted just to take a time out from um from their stress or from or from what they were working on it was a it was a place where they could you know a little bit of respite you know take a um you know take an hour and come to the museum and then for this reopening uh we also organized uh an exhibit kind of a rapid response community sourced exhibit of photographs whereby we asked anyone from any hurricane Ian impacted community to submit their to submit their their pictures of of the storm or or any aspect of the storm that was meaningful to them and we were going to exhibit all of them and and we did it wasn't you know there weren't um um you know there were none that were that were cut out and most of our submissions were from from residents of Sanibel Captiva, but not all. There, um, you know, plenty from Pine Island and uh, Fort Myers Beach, two other very heavily impacted communities. In fact, Fort Myers Beach is the most hard hit community, I think, from um, from this storm. And it was really a very powerful exhibit. It wound up being about 150 photographs from about 90 photographers, and um, you know, flood damage, of course. Uh, or, or, you know, and then the experience of living through the storm. There's this gentleman and his corgis sitting up on the dining room table. 
um, you know, as the water starts to come in. Wreckage, of course. Also scenes of, of people as they endeavored to get back to the island by whatever means they could uh, to um, visit their homes, assess the damage, save what they could. And then also turning the corner towards um, towards a brighter picture. There, here's a you know a picture of a group, uh, you know, new friends, old friends who had come together to uh, help muck out um, neighbors' houses, help start to repair things. Signs of returning wildlife, the beloved white pelicans that um, that come back each season, and did this one too. And then the relighting of the Sanibel Lighthouse in June. This um, this exhibit is uh, once we reclosed at the um, at the end of April uh, through a partnership with the um, with the Sanibel Public Library. Uh, this exhibit is now uh, on view there, so it continues to be on view free of charge. Uh, you can also see it online. Um, all the all the images online at um, at the museum's website. But this, you know, again, this um, this brief period of reopening and 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 this exhibit um, was a, a kind of a crystallization of, of I think some of the um, the best the best things that museums can be. I mean, museums are 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 a, kind of a, a funky mix of entertainment and education they're um they're they're bedrock institutions of their communities usually and uh but in this case it really it was um uh through you know through just being open and and through through this exhibit it was uh it was it was giving um giving people uh, a place to come to and something to connect with that um um that was very important in 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 those in those months and and the fact that you know again like uh like uh the community rallying in the sense of uh, you know getting people to the island this was a, an entirely community community um sourced exhibit and then just one last um sort of uh, visual representation of some of these sort of renewal moments is uh, a literal, you know, re replanting. So this is a, this is a part of the wetlands and the landscape uh, surrounding the museum, and it's um, it's it's state, you know, following following the storm, and recently, just I think within the last month, six weeks, um, through uh, with the help of of dozens of community members and organizations, including including fish, including Florida Gulf Coast University, including the Sanibel Captiva Rotary Club, including the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation, um, replanted um, all of these wetlands with over um, over 800 plants and grasses that um, um, that are, as you can see here, just 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 fledgling, but um, within you know within a year or two will be a uh, a beautiful grassy um wetlands once again and then um no slide for it but um um a, an essential critical and um deeply appreciated part of all of this is the is the philanthropy that um that has been outpouring um since the storm the museum has had over uh, 1000 donors um since the storm to help in in the rebuilding and recovery so, as I said, these aren't these aren't the only um, you know moments. These are <clears throat> these are these are uh, the highlights for um, for us close to the museum, and they've given us they've given us strength, and they have also helped to um, um, to create a vision for what's next. And I would say, you know, it started with um honestly the you know during that sort of shock and, and loss period there were there were several 
um, well reasoned uh, questions about you know after an event like this and and you know a, a near total wipeout like this, <clears throat> does a museum belong on a barrier island? And our conviction reached um, quite quickly um, and and fed by and inspired by some of these some of these moments we've just talked about is that this museum uh, cannot be anywhere else. This is a community um, community based community um, fed museum. Um, and it's a place-based museum. There are, there are terrific museums out there. Um, you know, take the Museum of Natural History in New York or take take the World War II Museum in New Orleans that don't um, that don't necessarily need to be exactly where they are. Other great museums like the 9/11 Museum in um, in New York does, of course, need to be there. But this is um, this is this is this is Sanibel, and this is where um this is where the audience is this is where people come for um for shells and people who develop an interest in uh, or one of one of the top places in this country uh where they come for this and this is where we can um use our collections and our exhibits as a gateway to teach so we turn quickly um to how can we how can we improve how can we be a better museum for this community, for our, our broader community. Um, what can we, as these islands change, and 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 they will, um, they're 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 changed now, and as they rebuild, it's going to be it's going to be a little bit different than it was before. Um, but how can we respond and and be the best uh, museum we can be for the next thirty years? So it's a commitment commitment to stay and a commitment um to to be better and and so much of that was inspired uh by the way the the people around us um uh came to the cause so there's um you know there are two ways that I'll, that I'll talk about one is um one is in education and um many perhaps on this program are are, are familiar with some of our, our our signature programs our school programs what we call Mollusks on the Move, which is a, an outreach program where we go out to schools throughout Southwest Florida with live mollusks and shells um, or lecture programs. But um, where we seek to expand is in our field education and programs. Part of what this, this post-storm period um, um, prompted, um, as we couldn't be doing programs at the museum, was creating a, a program of biodiversity walks throughout all of Lee County, where our educators um, um, uh, lead attendees on uh, wildlife observations with an emphasis on, on land snails and mollusks, but also on recording those for um, data collection for community science. So we see an expansion of these field education programs to make a stronger connection between what's happening inside the museum and what's happening in the ecosystems that surround our that surround our museum, and the other part relates to our permanent exhibits, and this is a a bigger step and a bigger investment. So this is um, again the you know the Great Hall of Shells, you know as it is today. So this these these exhibits, which represent the historic core of the museum, are um, uh, sustained damage from the storm, and there are also elements of them which um, after 30 years are showing some, some wear and tear and um, there are elements of them which, um, which could be updated in terms of content. And so taking a hard look at our permanent exhibits and how can we increase the, the educational value of a visit to the museum and, a, uh, and the visitor experience. These are also, this is another um, view of uh, of the Great Hall of Shells um, post-storm. And for us at the heart of that is a, a rethinking and a, 
redesign and a reinstallation of the the Great Hall of Shells. And so we set about in earnest uh, doing that uh, towards the end of the year and began looking at what examples um, around the world there are of exhibiting this kind of, of natural history that, um, that inspire us. Uh, this is a display from, uh, from Natural History Museum in Japan. This is from the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology in um, Cambridge, Mass. These are displays from a, uh, a museum in, in Austria. And, and then, of course, as mentioned before, the Houston Museum of Nature and Science, which um, um, you know, was uh, an inspiration to us last June, and also, um, you know, we see a we see a, a solidarity with Houston in now not just doubling down on on Sanibel and 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 the future of the islands and what and what comes next for the islands, but also on the um, exhibition, the contemporary exhibition of shells and 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 this kind of natural history. And so here is a um, a rough uh, schematic design of um, what we plan for a new great hall of shells, um, custom built cases with uh, beautiful backlighting and enabling uh, our goals in, in a, a new installation of the Great Hall of Shells are first uh, to exhibit uh, a much larger number of specimens than we had before. We'd been somewhere over a thousand before and we seek to um, uh, to more than, than double that with, um, with these new exhibits. In addition to exhibiting the specimens um, vertically um, and, and with mounts the way as, as, as you can see right here, the cases will will have drawers which um, can be pulled out and so visitors can um, um, see a lot more shells that way. In the middle will be a, a, a table case that um, that exhibits the uh, the global um, biodiversity of mollusks as they're as they're spread around um, spread around the earth. And then additional exhibits around the perimeter, um, will delve into subjects that were um, that will carry over from from um, from pre-storm, um, such as the the intersections with uh, human history and culture, but will also be we will also be by our reorganization of the content, we'll be adding um, entirely new exhibits um, in the Great Hall on the subject of conservation and the environment. So here, and for us, that will mean permanent exhibits on water quality in the region, on introduced and invasive species, on the problems of ocean acidification and, and warming oceans, and also um, stories of, of the conservation, um, success stories and, and those that have been less successful of, of mollusks, and, and also what what the average person can do um, to, um, um, you know, help help address these problems. We'll also have a new um, family and activity area um, in the Great Hall, and we see it as a, um, a a major upgrade to to the experience that visitors have, um, to the the range of of education that they can access, um, but also completing a modernization of the whole museum that began with the introduction of the aquariums in, uh, in 2020. And down on the aquarium level, we plan a uh, more modest, but also um, a uh, some improvements that will align with what's going on in the Great Hall of Shell. So here you see the the aquariums as they look today a, a, a blank slate um, if you will and I should say we don't plan any changes to the marine life that's on view in the aquariums so the um, the octopuses the cuttlefish um, all the different animals that were on view will be back what will change is the supporting exhibitry on the walls 
which previously was was rather minimal. And our plans are to introduce new exhibits about the uh, biology uh, of these animals and um, some of the amazing things we, that the amazing ways in which they've adapted, and then also the ways in which um, uh, the unique ways in which we care for these animals and give them enrichment. Here's another view of uh, aquariums post storm and our um, direction as we as we rebuild them. So we are looking forward to the next 30 years of the museum. And I thank you very much for, for listening. I thank you for, for caring. And uh, I'll be glad to um, answer any questions in the chat. Uh, before we get to those, I just want to plug a couple programs. Uh, the Biodiversity Walks I mentioned. Uh, the next one is on September 20th. It's free. If you'd like to participate, you can go to our education section and, um, and sign up for that. Uh, on September 27th, we have a, a uh, uh, one of our, we've been doing beach walks in partnership with Sanibel uh, Recreation Center, and you can contact the Recreation Center to, to sign up for that. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, Jose Leal's talk on calories, which will be on October 12th, and that's free. You can sign up through our website. Um, all the, all of our online lectures um, are archived and are available to view anytime uh, through the museum's website. So um, uh, previous lectures uh, included uh, a great presentation on freshwater mussels by John Pfeiffer from the Smithsonian, and, uh, and before that on Hawaiian land snails from a um, curator at the Bishop Museum in, in Hawaii. So those are, um, those are all online oh, over 20 are online and they're 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 free and free to watch and, and easy to access so um thank you so i will um go to the chat all right whoops okay all right some accolade thank you thank you folks thank you folks um Eric asks, are they going to be reconstructing the buildings next to the lighthouse? I haven't heard that. I wouldn't be the best source on that answer, but I, I haven't I haven't heard about plans to reconstruct um the buildings next to the lighthouse. And they were they were a uh, a loss for sure. Um so I don't know. And um I uh I'm not sure who to ask besides perhaps perhaps um uh somebody at the at the city offices. Okay, Angela asks, what is the evacuation plan for animals for the next major hurricane? Um very good question. And a um it's, it's an excellent question. So our um our hurricane preparedness plan policy prior to the storm. Uh, had been not to evacuate animals. And that was after um, consult with other aquariums. And the the thinking there is that the um, the sort of the the risk, the trauma of having a policy in place where you're constantly uh, moving animals. And then also the problem of, you never really know which way a hurricane is going to go. Where do you evacuate them to? Um, is uh, you know led to um, a, a generally standard policy within the aquarium field of it's it's more more risk in in the big picture uh, than reward to have a plan for evacuating animals. Afterwards, we, of course, revisited that and reached the same conclusion after um, continued consult with um, many other aquariums, including those that had been through uh, Hurricane Katrina and, and some really, really major storm events, which is that um, it's... Um, it's that's not that's not the right path to take. The only evacuation um, 
the policies we're aware of where animals are evacuated are are animals where the risk for um, trauma, um, damage, et cetera, is much lower, such as corals. But uh, um, our our policy remains the same. This was just a um, a, um, a a surge event that, um, of course, we hope we'll never never see again. Len asks, after Hurricane Ian, was there an abundance of shells all over Sanibel? I don't know. You know, we actually got a lot of questions at the time about that. And um, it was a long time before any of us got to the beach, to be honest. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know. My aunt, my guess is probably yes. I mean, there was this, uh, you know, mentioned before Hurricane Adalia, which, uh, you know, thankfully stayed offshore um, where we are. But the uh, the shells were were terrific after that, and um, that's that's one thing that that uh, comes out of storms is um, is uh, sh is shells on the beach. Kathy asks, um, asking when the aquariums are expected to be finished by by the end of the year. Um, it's it's tough to say exactly right now. We have a we have a you know an internal target of November fifteenth. There are and we're working aggressively towards that. Um, I don't you know I don't know for sure that we'll make that. I feel confident that we'll have the aquariums open open by the end of the year. David asks, I've heard there were plans to move the scientific collections to the mainland. Is that true? Um, good question. And yes, well, plans. No, I guess there aren't plans yet. Uh, there are ambitions to do that. So. Among the um, among the longer term um, goals we have um, are to take the research collection and to have a uh, um, an inland, you know, at least ten miles inland um, home for them. Uh, the the museum, as a as a as I just you know talked about before. We believe very strongly that the public component of the museum, um, that our, our our public serving mission um, and everything that goes into that <clears throat> belongs here and, and actually doesn't work anywhere else. But that but that uh, that research collection, which is um, um, which is which is so important. Um, We'd like to see that. We'd like to see that on a mainland location. We're focused first on on getting the museum put to, put back together and getting open. But over time, we would we would we would our goal is to work towards that. Question from Robert: Was any of the research collection lost due to Ian? No. <laughs> um, and uh, so yes, we're 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 very happy about that. Um, and we, uh, uh, no. So yeah, not only was none of the collection lost, but we we feel we we put the collection, and importantly, kind of the 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 there, there's this long story, but there's there's paper forms of data, um, in addition to online data that are associated with the specimens. And by moving as much of the collection as we did downstairs, we were able to um, to protect that data as well. So it's um, it's all in good shape. Thank you. Maxine asks, will you have a display specifically devoted to shells you might find on Sanibel? Yes. Or rather, um, Southwest Florida with, you know, kind of a focus within that on Sanibel and Captiva. So the main, in the new grade hall, the um, the main sort of exhibit uh, topics or areas, several are are ones that um, those of you familiar with the grade hall will, um, will recognize. There's uh, the shells of Southwest Florida. Um, there's shells in human history and culture and um, land snails, uh, fossils, um, what we call extremes. So either micro mollusks or world record shells, world record for those who don't know it. Those are the largest examples of a particular um, specimen ever, ever collected. Um, and then new sections added, as mentioned before, on conservation and environment and on a family activity area. But within that Southwest Florida um, section will be um, 
will be a um, a special focus on on the shells that are particular to Sanibel and Captiva, and also why, like I was talking about before, but why this area um, attracts shells in the way um, that it does. Another question about um, the other wonderful museum on the island, the historic Sanibel Museum and Historical Village is what's their status. They are, I believe, planning to reopen in October, um, perhaps November, but I think last I heard was October. And um, there, you know, there, there's, there's some damage there. I mean, you know, the, for sure, which is being repaired, but there are also plenty of the exhibits are, um, able to be viewed and enjoyed by the public so they're they're planning to open quite soon which is um which is great and they've got great new leadership and um uh, a new executive director mark Harmon, who um who started just just a few months ago leslie asked will the aquarium have a giant pacific octopus when it opens um if so has it been identified and where will it come from the answer is yes absolutely so we had two species of octopus on view prior to the storm giant pacific octopus so for those who don't know giant pacific octopus is the largest species of octopus in the world and an incredibly intelligent and amazing animal we will have giant pacific octopus again and then the other species of octopus is a two-spot octopus smaller um super cute and also uh very um um which is a great animal, but yes, we'll have two spot octopus as well. Our giant Pacific octopus, we, we, we get, uh, we source, uh, our giant Pacific octopus from the Pacific Northwest, which is, which is where they're from. And, um, there's a few, um, there's a small number of licenses that are, are granted to people who are allowed to, collect giant Pacific octopus, which means diving um, out in the open water and 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 collecting them in order that that they can be used for educational purposes such as aquariums. So we have somebody we work with in British Columbia and uh, and basically we we put in a call you know about about two weeks before um, uh, we hope to to have the animal on site and um, and he goes goes and collects it and and um, it gets shipped to the museum. So that um, um, it's actually an, an amazingly um, um, uncomplicated process for that. Um, so, but yeah, we look, we look very much look forward to having our giant Pacific octopus exhibit up and running again. Uh, Maxine asked, how about the outdated Calusa material will be improved? So good question. She's referring to our, um, our exhibits of, um, um, as relates to the the Calusa Indians, and this is a a, a culture that um, lived in this part of Florida. One of the very few um, indigenous cultures, North American indigenous cultures, that did not rely on agriculture because the sea life here was so abundant, including mollusks, which they ate many different kinds of species and would use shells for tools and uh, would create huge um, mounds of shells on which they would build um, build their cities. And uh, so shells and mollusks are uh, integral to, it was integral to the, the, the culture and the life of, of the Calusa. Um, yeah, short answer, yes, we are updating it. Um, and, um, and yeah, we look, we look forward to presenting the, the new exhibits on the Calusa. So, okay, I don't, I don't see any more questions, and um, I, uh, I thank you again for, uh, for joining and for your interest and for your support, and uh, you know, thanks for continuing to follow us as we, as we come back from this. Thanks for being part, part of this comeback and this renewal, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at the museum um, when we can. And when you get here. Okay. Good night.